Let's turn our attention now to the Word of God as we'll continue our study of the gospel according to St. Mark. And today we begin chapter 13, and I will be reading from verse 1 through verse 8. Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, with no guarantee that I'll be able to cover all eight verses in this morning's sermon. So I'd ask the congregation to rise for the reading of the Word of God. Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? And Jesus answered them, began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places. And there will be famines and troubles, and these are the beginnings of sorrows. Again, what you have just heard is the unadulterated Word of God involving the teaching that Jesus gives us here on matters that are critical to the content of the Christian faith. May God grant you ears to hear and hearts that are willing to embrace what our Lord has taught in this passage. Please be seated. Let us pray. O Lord, again we cry unto you that you would send help. Whereas we begin to deal with this most complex and difficult text, we need that help. We pray that You would guard us from error and help us through the much confusion that attends this text. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. I'm about to sail my ship this morning into troubled waters to say the least. For as we come to chapter 13 of the gospel according to Mark, we come now to the longest discourse of our Lord contained in this gospel, which discourse is also replicated with some small differing details in Matthew's gospel as well as in Luke's gospel. It is Jesus' lengthy discussion about the future destruction of the temple, of the destruction of Jerusalem, and of His coming in glory at the end of the age. On the one hand, this text represents the most amazing prediction of future events that we find in the New Testament, if there is any text that should prove the divine claims of Jesus, it is this text inasmuch as He predicts without any doubt the destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple years before that event came to place. This is predictive prophecy 
of the highest magnitude. And you would think that this text, more than any other, would vindicate and authenticate Jesus' claims to being the Son of God who speaks only those things that the Father has authorized. At the same time, there is no text in the New Testament that bears more dramatic witness to the inspiration of sacred Scripture than this text because of its uncanny accuracy for predicting the future with respect to the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem. However, there is no New Testament text that has been used more often with higher critical tools and from the pens of skeptics, both with respect to the identity of Christ and with respect to the trustworthiness of the New Testament, then this text. On the one hand, it's the most powerful apologetic we have for our Christology and the Scripture. On the other, it's the most controversial text that would work against the truth claims of Christianity. And Bertrand Russell wrote his book, Why I Am Not a Christian. He cited a portion of this discourse as being one of the chief reasons for his rejection of Christianity. I don't think there was a week that went by when I was in seminary that some biblical scholar didn't seek to rub our noses in the difficulties of the Olivet Discourse, trying to use the text that I partially read this morning to disprove the truth claims of the Bible. Well, how can that be when what Jesus said would take place did take place clearly with the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem? Well, the problem is this that in addition to his prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple, incorporated in this discourse was his prediction about his own coming in clouds of glory at the end of the age. And the problem is this, that as we will see when the disciples asked for the time reference of these things, Jesus here and also in Matthew's gospel, makes the assertion that that generation would not pass away until all of the things included in this discourse came to pass, which would include His coming in clouds of glory. Bertrand Russell says, see, Jesus said that He would come back within the course of one generation and he failed to do it. So as amazing as the destruction of the temple was and the destruction of Jerusalem, the credibility of Jesus and the credibility of the New Testament collapses with the time frame reference by which Jesus predicted His coming in glory. I have to say that in my estimation, Conservative Christians, evangelical scholars who have struggled with the tension of this text, for the most part, fail to feel the real weight of this problem. I think it's the most weighty problem that we have in the New Testament with respect to the truth claims of the nature of Christ and of Scripture. So when I say we're sailing into troubled waters. We are sailing into troubled waters indeed, and I'm not sure, and I have to say this up front, how to handle all of the difficulties that present themselves in the Olivet Discourse. I have written an entire book on the matter in which I present a minority report of a very small minority report, I should add, on how I approach this particular portion of Scripture. But again, as we look at it in the weeks to come, 
let us understand that we are dealing with a very complicated matter here and one that touches the heart of the church's confession. We read the Nicene Creed today, and as the Apostles' Creed affirms, so does the Nicene Creed affirm that we believe not only in the death of Christ and in the resurrection of Christ, but we believe in the future coming, in the return of Christ in glory to consummate His kingdom. So, given those professions of faith, what do we do with this? In the critical theories of our day, much attention has been given to what has been called a postponement theology or the story of the parousia delay, that is, the delay of Jesus coming in glory. And the critical scholars say that later on in the New Testament, in Paul's epistles, for example, you already begin to see the church falling back to punt. It's fourth down. Jesus hasn't come in the time frame that everybody expected Him to come, and so the New Testament had to revise its future expectancy of the return of Christ. Now, all of that's background for the problem, and now I want us to take the time to look at the text itself, and as we do through the coming weeks, when we see these problems that are so painful, I will endeavor to point them out and by God's grace give some optional ways to resolve the difficulties. Chapter 13 begins then, that as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. As they're leaving this place where Jesus had seen the widow give her might in the treasury and where so much of these debates had taken place, now as they're leaving and making their way to the Mount of Olives opposite the temple complex, one of the disciples turns and looks at this magnificent structure that truly was one of the wonders of the ancient world, and still in amazement at this building, which he had probably seen hundreds and hundreds of times, he says to Jesus, look at that. Isn't that something? And that to which he directed the gaze of Jesus was not the temple built by Solomon in the Old Testament, which temple had been destroyed. But now the temple that was being rebuilt by Herod the Great. The construction of this temple had begun by Herod 50 years before Jesus was looking at us on this occasion. And it still wasn't finished. Now, to give you some idea, of the Herodian temple, the outer court measured 500 by 300 yards, not feet. The outer court, five football fields by three football fields. The temple itself took up 35 acres of ground. The building we're in here this morning is situated on just slightly less than six acres that we own here. And if you can multiply that six times, not just this building, but the whole acreage by six times, you get some idea of the size of the temple. Herod was known throughout the world for his incredible construction products and for the development of what has been called ever since Herodian stone. Josephus tells us that some of the stones that made up the temple were 60 feet long. We're talking one stone. 60 feet long, 11 feet high, 8 feet deep, each stone weighing over a million pounds. And again, some of the historians of antiquity said 
that the temple of Herod in Jerusalem looked like a mountain of marble decorated with gold. We heard in the reading this morning of the instructions for the building of the furniture for the tabernacle in the wilderness, how, for example, just even the poles that were inserted in the exterior of the Ark of the Covenant were to be made of acacia wood covered with pure gold. You listen to the descriptions and embellishments of the design of the mercy seat, pure gold. And so, now with this massive temple that is being built by Herod, almost finished at this point, it was considered to be a mountain of marble and gold. Now, the wall of the temple, 150 feet high. The sanctuary itself was 150 feet high. This is like 33 feet. Go up more than five times, and you get the idea of the height of the interior of the sanctuary of the temple in Jerusalem. If you've ever been to Jerusalem today in the modern period, it's an incredible sight where you see the walls of Jerusalem rising out of the desert floor. At night, they're illuminated with giant searchlights, and you can see that wall now that surrounds the old city is 75 feet high, and it takes your breath away when you look at it. And then you go inside, and you see the archaeologists have dug down below the wall 75 more feet, where they reach the base of the wall that surrounded Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. And that, that just blows you away when you realize what you're looking at today is only half of what was there at the time of Jesus. And so, the columns that held up the portico, for example, were so large that it would take three men expanding their arms to the fingertips, and three men could barely put their arms around one column. So obviously, I don't need to tell you much more, this was an incredible building. And they're looking at this and standing in awe of what seems to be an impregnable structure that no thing imaginable could ever destroy. And so, as the disciples are in awe at this magnificent edifice, and Jesus responds and says, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another, shall not be thrown down. See those 60 feet by 8 feet by 11 feet stones of a million pounds? They're going to be crushed into the dust. Now, sometimes we can make future prognostications based upon trends that are going on currently, but there were no trends in the ancient world that would allow somebody a natural prediction or prognostication that would see the destruction of this magnificent building where the stones themselves would be cast down. Indeed, in the future history, it would take the full measure and magnitude of the entire power of the Roman armies to bring this prophecy to pass. Now they reach the Mount of Olives, and as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately. Now here's where we begin to get into some trouble. Because the questions that the disciples brought to Jesus about his prediction of the destruction of the temple was this. Tell us, he said, when will these things be? And what will be the sign 
when all of these things will be fulfilled. Now, there, there's a phrase here that we have to take note of because it occurs throughout the Olivet Discourse, and it is the phrase, these things, tauta, and the phrase, when will be the sign that all these things, tauta ponta, all of these things shall come to pass. Two questions here. When and what will be the sign that it's about to happen? And so, when we read the response of Jesus to this, let me ask you to do something. Try to imagine that you're one of the disciples who's just asked that question. Jesus has made a specific prediction about the destruction of the temple, and now they say, when? That's a straightforward question, isn't it? And what will be the sign, the outward manifestation that all of this is about to happen? They're asking about the signs of the times. They're asking about the signs of the fulfillment of this prophecy, which, as we will see later, includes Jesus' prediction of His return in the clouds of glory. And we will see later on in the text that encompassed within the phrase, all of these things, includes His prediction of His return at the end of the age, and, as I said, the destruction of Jerusalem. So let me telescope these just for a moment. If Jesus says, look, three things are going to happen, one, that this temple is going to be destroyed, two, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, three, I'll be coming on the clouds of glory at the end of the age. And the first question out of their mouths is, well, when's that? Now, the standard view that you find among Christians today is that this will happen perhaps soon, since so many things going on in Israel and Jerusalem now, that maybe we're at that point when finally Jesus is going to return, and all of these prophecies in the Olivet Discourse will be fulfilled. It's a long time past the demise of that first generation, but um, again, imagine yourself in the disciples' shoes, and they say to Jesus, when are these things going to take place? And He says to them, not one generation will pass away until all of these things are fulfilled. What would you think He meant? Would you imagine that He's talking about something that was going to take place more than 2,000 years later? Or something that's going to take place in the near future, at least within the framework of one generation, which in Jewish terms measured 40 years. Elsewhere, in similar predictions, Jesus says, you will not go over all of the cities of Israel until you will see the kingdom of God coming in power. Elsewhere, He says, some of you will not taste death until all of these things are fulfilled. If you look at those three texts together, as critical scholars do, and as Bertrand Russell did, it says it's clear that Jesus taught and expected the consummation of His kingdom to occur within a time frame of 40 years. Didn't happen. So here we are trying to dig up His bones and the bones of Mary Magdalene. Well, let's look at how Jesus answers their very straightforward question. Jesus, answering them, began to say, take heed that no one deceives you. So the first thing He warns them about is deception. They ask, when are these things going to take place? He said, first of all, you have to be careful because there will be attempts to deceive you about these matters. So, be careful. 
For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. So the first sign that he gives of the fulfillment of his prophecy is the sign of false messiahs that will come. Now again, people that are looking for a yet future fulfillment of this point to people in our day who claim to be God incarnate and uh, false prophets that abound here and there. However, the first century was known with significant false messiahs who claimed to be the return of Jesus. And those are documented in Jewish history, particularly in the writings of Josephus. So Jesus predicted false messiahs would come, and false messiahs did come before the temple was destroyed. Let's keep that in front of us. Second of all, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. I see people reading the paper today, and they say, every time a war breaks out in Iran or Iraq or wherever it is, they say, see, this is a sign of the time, Jesus is coming right around the corner because we're hearing all about these wars and rumors of wars. But of course, there are wars and rumors of wars in every generation. Meanwhile, you're sitting there, you're one of the disciples, and they're asking Jesus what will be the sign when these things will happen, and He said, well, be careful, don't be deceived. There will be rumors of wars and wars before these things take place. Now, you're a disciple of Jesus, and you're thinking that these rumors of wars and wars are something that will be a harbinger that will come before the destruction of the temple and before the destruction of Jerusalem. So you're going to pay attention in your lifetime to wars and to rumors of wars. In A.D. 40, the mad emperor Caliglia tried to establish a statue of himself in the sacred precincts of the temple in Jerusalem. And because of that, rumors were rife that war was about to break out where the Romans were going to invade the Jews to try to stop their protests against this profound sacrilege of an emperor trying to establish his statue in the sacred place of the Jewish temple. But as it were, they were just rumors. And war did not break out until the Jewish revolt in A.D. 66, which then ended in the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. But Jesus says, you'll hear about these things, don't be troubled. Such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines, and there will be troubles, and these are just the beginning of sorrows. And so again, today modern prognosticators who are looking for the return of Jesus anytime in the next few weeks call attention to the serious famines that affect the world in our day, famines that have broken out in uh, Armenia, famines that have taken such a tremendous toll in Ethiopia and other nations in Africa in our time. Yet at the same time, in between the years 41 and 54 A.D., during the reign of Claudius, who came after Caliglia and before Nero, there were several serious famines that affected the Near Eastern community. Also, a tremendous earthquake hit the region of Phrygia in the year 61 AD and leveled the city of Pompeii in the year 63. So in that time frame of the first generation, 
terrible famines, wars, rumors of wars, and earthquakes all took place in the lifetime of most of the surviving disciples and apostles. The historian, the ancient historian Tacitus, records in great detail manifold disasters that took place between Jesus' prediction of this destruction and the actual destruction of the temple in 70 A.D., which leads me to conclude that when Jesus is talking about the signs here that have to take place before the end actually occurs, those signs that are just the beginning of sorrows, I believe our Lord was calling attention to things that were going to happen in the first century, which in fact did happen in the first century. But the reason that we transfer them and transpose them to the yet unfulfilled future is because what didn't happen apparently was His return in the clouds of glory. So do you see how this kind of squeezes and puts the pressure on our temples here as we seek to understand it. If we're going to look for the signs of the times, let's look first of all in the first generation. Now, let me just say one thing by way of anticipating how we're going to resolve this problem. I remember 40 years ago, walking down a street in Wenham, Massachusetts, in a long, leisurely stroll with Dr. William Lane, who spent more than 10 years researching the scholarly work in interpreting the Gospel of Mark. And Dr. Lane, at that very time, was working on chapter 13 and working through this problem. And as we were talking, he became almost giddy because he felt that he had had an epiphany that explained these difficulties that we find in the Olivet Discourse tied into these phrases that I've already mentioned, all of these things. And of course, when his commentary was completed, he set forth that epiphany in it. And I remember 40 years ago being very excited. I'm thinking, hey, you know, I think you have something here, and this may be the solution to this awful problem. I don't believe that anymore. (laughs) I'm, I'm not satisfied with that problem. Now, what usually scholars do is they talk about predictive prophecy that will have an immediate fulfillment as a type, and then a later fulfillment in its full magnitude. And that's maybe what we have here in chapter 13. Or others have squeezed the text about this generation, and we'll look at that further when we get to it in chapter 13. But again, I have yet to find any explanation for all of these difficulties that totally resolves it, at least to my satisfaction. I hate to stand up here before you as your pastor and preach a sermon on, and not just one sermon, but many sermons on a particular text of Scripture where I end up saying, I don't know. I can give you some ideas, but before we try to solve a problem, it's absolutely essential that we understand the full measure of that problem. And then what we're dealing with here is something of the highest magnitude of importance for the credibility of Jesus and the credibility of Scripture. I'm much more concerned about that than I am to defend any particular eschatology or any particular millennial view. As you know, there are many of those that divide Christians and divide them seriously. But we'll look at these issues more thoroughly as the text progresses. Let's pray. Father, help us not to be dismayed by the difficulties that we read here, and nevertheless be overjoyed 
by the profound accuracy of our Lord's prediction of future things, and that our confidence may be full, that everything that He said would take place indeed is spoken with utmost truth. For we ask these things in His name. Amen.